Good afternoon to you all. A warm welcome on behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, this afternoon, or hearing will consider the question of the human rights of migrants and legislative reforms in the United States. Uh, we expect during the course of today's hearing to receive information on the problem of mandatory deportation and uh, we'll be particularly interested um, in follow-up to the 2010 report on immigration in the United States, detention and due process issued by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, I wish to, um, to introduce to you my fellow commissioners. Uh, on my right is Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, who is um, the rapporteur with responsibility for migrant persons. Um, we have Commissioner Rosemary Antoine, with us today, and also Commissioner Rodrigo Escobar Hill. Um, in due course, I'm sure we'll be joined by either the Deputy Executive Secretary or the Executive Secretary. Secretary. Uh, we have a number of petitioning organizations, and in due course, um, they'll introduce um, to us those who are presenting from the National Day Labor Organizing Network the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the Gibbs Houston Poe, the Center for Justice and International Law, Sahil, the Stanford Immigrants' Rights Clinic, the Boston College Post-Deportation Human Rights Project, the Immigration Equality Advocates for Human Rights, and Boston University. We want, wish to warmly welcome all of you today. Um, we also welcome the representatives of the United States and the Deputy Permanent Representative and his delegation, um, and in due course we'll have an opportunity to hear from the state as well. Can I offer the floor to the petitioners to hear the relevant information from you? Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon. We do want to thank uh, all of the petitioners, want to thank the Commission for this opportunity to present our concerns. My name is Robert Powell, appearing on behalf of the petitioners, and we have several co-panelists uh, with me today. The petitioners have requested this hearing because of the ongoing violations of the American Declaration that are caused by the U.S. deportation policy, especially as the U.S. continues its deportation policy uh, we see that the right to family life is not respected and the best interests of the children are not protected. This commission's decision in Smith and Armendariz, uh, which has recommended a balancing test that uh, the family life and children's interests are, are uh, considered before deportation, that decision has not been implemented. The United States deports approximately 400,000 people every year. The great majority of those deportations involve the breakup of families. The devastating impact on family life and on children has been described in one of our submissions, uh, the brief called Psychosocial Impact of Detention and Deportation. The impact on family life is not just a temporary disruption, but it's a permanent destruction of the family. Under current immigration practices, there's no realistic possibility after a person has been deported, of re reuniting that person with his or her family. To some extent, the ongoing violations are caused by the oppressive laws that were enacted in 1996 by the United States Congress, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, what we call IIRA. In order for the United States to come fully into compliance with its obligations under the American Declaration, its immigration laws must be changed by Congress there should be comprehensive immigration reform of the immigration laws. Yet in many cases, the existing statute does allow for discretion in the implementation and the interpretation of the existing laws. Many of the abuses against families and children that we see could be avoided uh, if all of the people involved in the enforcing of the, uh, these laws were aware of the requirements of the American Declaration and acted in accordance with its requirements. For example, I will just give one example, but there are many others and uh, many presented by uh, other people on the panel this, this afternoon. 
But for one example, <clears throat> the current law, current immigration law is unforgiving with respect to non-criminal immigration violations where a person has crossed the border unlawfully for more than one time, the person is subject to mandatory deportation uh, without any possibility for a waiver, without any possibility for, for consideration of the family right and the interests of the children involved. This lack of a waiver is not required under the statute. There are waivers available in the statutory scheme that would allow for consideration of family life and children's interests. This uh, result comes about because the Board of Immigration Appeals, who acts under the Attorney General, the Attorney General under U.S. law has the ability to interpret the statute. The Board of Immigration Appeals um, has discretion how to interpret the statute and has decided not to make these waivers available. Uh, the Attorney General has the authority to change that if he or she wants to do that. And, and uh, so the possibility of a waiver in this scenario uh, is a possibility under existing law. That could be done as a matter of discretion. Nevertheless, uh, these concerns about family life and protecting children uh, are not effectively incorporated into our law. Petitioners believe that, imp that an important part of bringing the United States into compliance with the American Declaration involves not only specific recommendations about policy, but also the education of decision makers. So we believe that it's important that the Commission affirm that all of the decision makers, um, all of the officials in the US, under US law who are making these decisions, and especially the Attorney General, who supervises the immigration judges and the Board of Immigration Appeals, um, that all of those officials, um, we believe it's important for the Commission to affirm that all of those decision makers have a responsibility to be aware of the obligations of the United States under the American Declaration. In this regard, we ask, uh, we suggest that uh, training for immigration officers uh, regarding the requirements of the American Declaration would be appropriate, would be helpful. Uh, many of those uh, decision makers are not aware of uh, the, their obligations under the American Declaration. Also, we think it would be very helpful for there to be a working group established um, under the Department of Homeland Security uh, who could be in touch with advocates who are working on behalf of uh, migrant families uh, and who can uh, be in touch uh, also with the Department of State uh, regarding the obligations uh, under the American Declaration. My co-panelists will uh, present additional uh, examples of the problems that arise uh, with respect to discretion under United States law. Atenas Barolo and David Watnick from the Stanford Immigrants' Rights Clinic will describe the government's policy of prosecutorial discretion in the deportation process and how this policy fails to respect the right to family life. Saul Merlos is from the New, Orle New Orleans Center for Racial Justice. Uh, will discuss the impact of U.S. deportation policy on himself uh, and uh, his own family, as well as members of the community where he lives. Uh, Salvador Sar Sarmiento, I uh, will speak on behalf of the AFL-CIO and Endalon and address specific concerns about workplace raids and racial profiling. And Charles Abbott from Sahil will then uh, conclude with some concluding remarks. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Distinguished Commissioners, my name is Atenas Burrola and I'm here with the Stanford Clinic. Today's hearing is about people like Amelia Reyes Jimenez and her children. When U.S. immigration agencies chose to deport Amelia to Mexico, her four children were placed in foster care. Eventually, Amelia was deported, her parental rights were terminated, and she lost her children to adoption. This story is not rare. In 2012, 150,000 U.S. citizen children suffered a parent's deportation. In 2011, 5,100 children became wards of the state because of the detention or deportation of a parent. These family tragedies happen because U.S. immigration officials fail to use prosecutorial discretion. Prosecutorial discretion refers to a power that U.S. immigration agencies have. They can choose whether or not to deport a non-citizen. These agencies have many chances to use prosecutorial discretion to keep families together, but they routinely fail to do so. For example, they can choose whether to begin deportation proceedings, whether to end proceedings, 
and whether to carry out a deportation odor that would destroy a family like Amelia's. These agencies can also choose to allow deported non-citizens to re-enter the United States to visit their families. Immigration officials can deport someone like Amelia without ever considering her family ties. Immigration officials do not even have to ask about a non-citizen's family ties before starting deportation proceedings. As a result, families like Amelia's are ripped apart. International standards and this commission's recommendations require due consideration of family unity and the rights of the child in deportation decisions. But U.S. prosecutorial discretion policies violate international standards and this commission's previous recommendations in at least three ways. First, the agency that enforces immigration laws at U.S. borders does not have a publicly available prosecutorial discretion policy. This agency, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, is responsible for guarding U.S. borders and its agents can place non-citizens into deportation proceedings. CBP appears to have an internal policy about prosecutorial discretion, but the policy does not require the consideration of family unity and the rights of the child. We recommend that CBP issue a public prosecutorial discretion policy requiring consideration of family unity and the rights of the child in all deportation decisions. CBP should be accountable for its position on prosecutorial discretion. A public prosecutorial discretion policy would provide CBP agents and non-citizens with notice that agents must take family ties into account at all phases in the deportation process. Now, my colleague will discuss the second and third ways U.S. prosecutorial discretion policies violate international standards. Thank you. I'm David Watnick from Stanford. Second, the government agency that enforces immigration laws within the United States also fails to sufficiently consider family unity. This agency, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, has a publicly available prosecutorial discretion policy, but the policy does not require consideration of family unity and the rights of the child. It does not even include family unity in a list of factors needing particular care in prosecutorial discretion decisions. We recommend that ICE change its policy to require agents to consider family unity at every phase of the deportation process. ICE should give particular care to family unity. And third, no policy requires U.S. immigration agents to consider family unity and the rights of the child when deciding to, whether to allow deported non-citizens um, to re-enter the United States to visit family. These agents rarely allow deported non-citizens to temporarily return to be with their families. We recommend that these agencies develop policies requiring agents to consider family unity when making re-entry decisions. We recommend that these agencies make that policy publicly available so that non-citizens know they can apply for re-entry into the United States in order to visit their families. The United States should spare hundreds of thousands of families like Amelia's the painful, traumatic, and unnecessary deportation of a family member. The United States should change its prosecutorial discretion policies to require immigration agents to consider family unity and the rights of the child. As this Honorable Commission stated in Smith and Armendariz versus the United States, the United States should ensure that non-citizens residents' right to family life is duly protected and given due process on a case-by-case -case basis. The legislative changes are necessary to bring the United States into full compliance with international human rights standards. U.S. immigration authorities have the power to immediately improve their prosecutorial discretion policies. Families like Amelia's need that protection now. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es... Good afternoon. My name is Saul Merlos. I am a member of the uh, New Orleans uh, Day Labor Organizing uh, Network, and I want to talk to you what I have has happened to me as a result of the raids. New Orleans in Kenner City. Many of our colleagues were working in construction. We were victims because they owed us our salary, and the bosses said they were going to pay us 
and they called us to certain apartments. They said they would uh, pay us that morning, but instead the migration authorities, immigration authorities and the police came. Immigration, it took many uh, of those who had gone into the apartments. I was in one of those apartments. There was a pregnant woman there and a two-year-old girl. They humiliated quite a bit everyone who they took inside. There were several of us, about six people. They shouted at the woman. They made her cry. And I also told them that she was expecting a baby, that she was pregnant. They took us out. They shouted at us. And they told us that what were we doing in this country if it was their country. Many of us were arrested for several days. I then got out. I was a member of the Congress of Day Laborers. A few months went by, and then a colleague of mine had me be a witness to this aggressive attack. Immigration located me in the parking lot of a certain apartments, and they arrested me once again. They took me to a jail or prison in Louisiana, and I got out four weeks later. When I got out, I had press. Uh, I spoke at press conferences about the raids and the abuse that we suffered in prison. One week later, I was summoned to immigration, and immigration arrested me once again. They said they don't need me outside the jail. They're going to return me to jail because I was going to be deported. I called the head of the organization and my attorney, Julie, and they asked immigration not to do the same thing once again, to give me time. And they said no. They, they arrested me once again. They bound me at the feet and the hands. They took me to the jail once again. And after certain hours of struggle through the Congress organization, I got out once again. And I'm facing deportation in December. I'm representing many of my uh, companions, colleagues, and many of us who are, uh, there are 32 of us, there's a campaign called the 32 from the South because we're facing deportation problems. I have a 13-year-old daughter, Amy. I've been here for 18 years. And in terms of what the President has said about deportations, last Friday, another friend was deported. They took him and left uh, the child at the school. He took the child to the school bus so she could go to school. And they uh, took him when he got home. And they held, they didn't pay attention to our petitions. They held him for two days and then deported him. So all of us in New Orleans are struggling. We're engaged in this struggle because we are being hard hit everywhere in stores in gasoline stations. They're chasing us down as though we were animals, and so we are waging the struggle, engaged in it. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Thank you, commissioners and representatives of the state. I speak today on behalf of the National Day Labor Organizing Network, Andilon, and the AFL-CIO. Uh, the AFL-CIO represents the largest trade union federation in the U.S., over 11 million workers and families. Andilon is a national network of day laborers. Uh, my brief remarks are going to focus on the crisis that has already been described by my, by my uh, co-panelists. Uh, everybody, I think, agrees that the continued and heightened enforcement of an immigration regime, regime that everybody knows is broken, is costly, is inhumane, uh, what, what, we're, we're going to try to elaborate a little bit what this crisis means. Uh, definitely it consists of individual violations of protections guaranteed both in inter-American jurisprudence and under universal jurisprudence for workers' rights, for non-discrimination, for family unity, and for due process. It also represents the cumulative, the cumulative effects of all these individual rights violations, represents grave concerns about access to basic services, to civil political rights, including the right to freedom of speech and association. As was already mentioned, by the end of 2013, this administration will have deported two million men and women, along with the deportation quota that was mentioned of 400,000 people every year. We ask, how does, how does this take place? 
And the answer is a massive criminalization and deportation, deportation dragnet program. What's, what we want to focus on about this crisis is two things. Um, two, two, two things to articulate what this, what this crisis is that really have undermined really basic fundamental pillars of U.S. constitutional protections. Number one, federal programs such as Secure Communities, ESCOM, and 287G have undermined constitutional precedent that ensures the separation of federal immigration enforcement and local state law enforcement. Such, mo such programs, as was everybody in the room knows, obvious in Arizona, encourage racial profiling and discrimination, facilitate abuse by employers, instill widespread fear among immigrant and minority communities. A recent study that came out of Chicago uh, sh you know, showed that in major U.S. cities, um, upwards of 44 percent of Latinos in major U.S. cities would would are less likely to reach out to the police to local law enforcement if they are victims or if they are witnesses to crime because they fear this entanglement between federal immigration authorities and local and local police. That's the first pillar that's being undermined by this massive deportation dragnet. The second one is undermining basic basic labor rights, freedom of association, and, uh, and speech. And just to give one example, um, in 2012, this is one example of what happens quite often. In 2012, 150 immigrant workers at a pizza shop out in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, delivered a unionization petition to their employers. Days later, the employers asked 89 workers to provide documentation verifying that they had the right to work in the U.S. They ostensibly, they cited a previously issued I-9 audit request. Within 10 days, almost all of those workers were fired. Already, U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence had severely undermined the workplace rights of immigrants, and I think most folks are familiar with the Supreme Court case of Hoffman Plastic Compound from 2002, which denies undocumented workers back pay or, re or reinstatement, which is basically some of the most important, important remedies for labor rights violations. Combined with, these, with this Supreme Court pr precedent that already existed, combined with this massive deportation dragnet, you're basically ensuring that the status quo ensures a chilling effect of immigrant workers' efforts to defend themselves, both at the workplace and in their communities, and also emboldens employers to thwart labor law with, with amazing impunity. And just to mention that in, in the, the commissioner's packets, we included the, an op-ed, the editorial op-ed from the New York Times this morning, um, which specifically addresses all these issues. The title is Not One More, referring to the Not One More deportation campaign, along with several other reports. Uh, one thing that we wanted to put on the commissioner's um, radar is uh, under the, the 2010 uh, report on immigration in the U.S., detention and due process, there is somewhat of a tacit acceptance of uh, what these so-called silent I-9 raids um, because we, we, at the time, everybody thought it was, a, it was better than these outright, you know, offensive raids with guns drawn. Um, you know, over the, the, the period of 10 years, I think we've, we've come to understand that the, the, they have almost the same impact with the targeting, dismissal, and at times deportation of undocumented workers, uh, despite, you know, all their benefit to the industries, um, is tacit of acceptance of serious workers' rights violations. I'll conclude by saying that we... We understand, and it's quite well agreed by legal scholars and my colleagues at the table, that there's numerous avenues, administrative avenues and congressional and judicial, to address the crisis that we're referring to, uh, including compliance with these initial memos and the civil and labor, uh, labor rights memo uh, um, and uh, additional mechanisms that have been pronounced but have not been implemented. And we understand that it's the duty of the state as a whole to remedy the situation. However, regardless of the inaction or the action of Congress or of the judicial branch, it is basic international, a, a basic principle of international law that in the face of inaction by the legislature, by the judiciary, it is ultimately the duty of the executive branch to ensure compliance of the state as a whole of all three branches of government and all three levels of government. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. My name is Charles Abbott from the Center for Justice and International Law, SECIL. As my colleagues have expressed to this honorable commission, 
The United States government's failure to comply with its human rights obligations, including specific recommendations already made by this commission, currently results in a number of uh, violations of the rights of migrant families, children, and communities. Um, we thank the Inter-American Commission for their principled monitoring of this situation over the years, which has included uh, 12 hearings on, this, on the subject of migration in the United States prior to this one. Um, and a series of important recommendations which we, uh, which we lay out in writing in, in detail for the commissioners and the state, uh, the, the distinguished representatives of the state. Um, based on the foregoing, uh, the petitioners point out that the United States must seize this historic opportunity to finally comply with international human rights standards, including those uh, named explicitly by this commission, through comprehensive legislative reform. Uh, additionally, before this even happens, there are a number of administrative measures the United States can and must uh, take immediately to better guarantee the rights of, uh, of migrants in the United States. Based on the foregoing, the petitioners respectfully request that this Honorable Commission uh, include the information presented during this hearing in its annual report and additionally issue a thematic report, including the following findings and recommendations. Reaffirm the Commission's recommendation that the United States should enact legislative reform to allow non-citizens to reunite with family, to apply for waivers on all grounds of deportation or inadmissibility, to be adjudicated on a case-by-case -case basis, giving due consideration to humanitarian defenses, including the rights of the family and the rights of children who are affected. Also, immediately undertake administrative reforms, affirming the obligation of all decision-makers in the deportation process uh, have an obligation to interpret and apply laws in a matter that ensures family life and the best interests of children are protected in accordance with the American Declaration. Undertake all legislative, administrative, judicial, and other measures necessary to ensure that labor rights and other human rights are guaranteed equally and without discrimination on the basis of a regular migratory status, as the Inter-American Court has already uh, spelled out in its advisory opinion on the, on the matter. Uh, also, in order to better ensure compliance with the American Declaration, recommends training sessions or seminars for U.S. law enforcement personnel, government attorneys, immigration adjudicators and immigration judges, federal judges, and other decision makers involved uh, in implementing the obligations of the United States under the American Declaration. We additionally request that the Commission monitor U.S. deportation and detention policy uh, in recognition of the transversal nature of the rights of migrant families and migrant workers through the rapporteurship on the rights of migrants, but also the rapporteurship on the rights of children, on the rights of human rights defenders, the rapporteurship on the rights of women, and the rapporteurship on the rights of LGBTI persons. Um, furthermore, we request that the United States Department of Homeland Security establish an IACHR working group that, in consultation with the Department of State, will remain in consultation with the Commission uh, concerning the implementation of the Commission's recommendations and will be available to advise immigration enforcement officers and adjudicators to ensure compliance with the American Declaration. Uh, we further request a, uh, a new on-site visit to the United States to monitor uh, the situation of, of the human rights of migrants. And we request that the, that the United States, in compliance with uh, follow-up from the 2010 report, um, continue to, uh, to make all efforts and, and uh, mobilize all uh, state entities involved to produce disaggregated data on detention and detailed statistics on the exercise of prosecutorial discretion and discretionary waivers for reentry. Um, if, uh, if the commissioners and uh, the, the distinguished representatives of the state uh, would agree, we have additional members of our declaration who have, of, our, uh, of our delegation who haven't had an opportunity to present, but we would be glad to give them a chance to answer uh, either questions from the commissioners or um, if the state would cede additional time. If you, I would prefer to give you an additional opportunity after we have immediately heard from the state and the commissioners. So you may wish other members of your delegation to join the table, and I'll give you an opportunity to do so in a few minutes. Thank you, Honorable Commissioner. Can I invite the state to respond? Thank you, Madam Chair. Distinguished commissioners, Madam Deputy Executive Secretary of the Commission, Petitioners, Secretary of Colleagues, my name is Lawrence Gambiner. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. I'm joined here at the table by Ms. Rachel Owen, also of the U.S. Mission to the OAS, Ms. Margaret Pickering of the Department of State's legal staff, and Mr. Andrew Stevenson, also of the U.S. OAS 
mission. We are pleased to be here with you today. I would like to begin by reaffirming that the United States takes the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its role in the OAS very seriously and is committed to addressing with you human rights issues in the hemisphere, including in the United States. We have worked steadfastly in recent years to increase our engagement with the Commission on important human rights issues facing our country. We have actively participated in the Commission's meetings, hearings, and expert consultations. We are dedicated to the process and make every effort to ensure the appropriate level of participation to provide the Commission with the opportunity to engage with a full array of policymakers and decision makers in the U.S. government. We take pride in the Commission's role in our region and are open to engagement. We welcome the hearings today on this topic of concern to NGOs, to civil society, and to the public. However, events in the last month have prevented the United States from preparing sufficiently in order to engage as fully as we would like for today's hearing. Consistent with the Commission's rules, providing for no less than 30 days notice of hearings, the United States received four notices for hearings on the evening of Friday, September 27, each of which included voluminous statements and submissions by interested private persons. Just a few days later, on October 1, most of the U.S. federal government shut down and did not reopen until October 17. This extraordinary event prevented the United States from undertaking full and adequate preparations for the hearings today. With the government closed and most of its employees furloughed, we lost the time essential for us to engage our interagency colleagues and prepare for these hearings. In particular, many of the specific government agencies with expertise in the matters to be raised in this hearing did not have staff on the job to consider the Commission's communications and assist in preparations. It was for these reasons that on October 8th and again on October 18, the United States sent separate letters to the Commission requesting a postponement of all U.S. hearings and working meetings until the February 2014 sessions. Please be aware that we made these requests after much consultation and with the understanding that petitioners, NGOs, and the public deserve robust participation from the United States, something we knew would not be possible with such a limited amount of time. The experts from throughout our government who returned to work after more than two weeks of furlough were not able at this late stage to identify witnesses, prepare testimony, gather documentation, and do the work necessary to fully respond to the issues to be raised. Given the sensitive and important nature of this matter before the Commission, and because the United States takes its engagement with the Commission seriously, it typically takes the entire 30-day period for my government to prepare fully researched and coordinated responses. The bottom line is that unfortunately today we are not in the position to address the issues raised in your petition. We are here to carefully listen to what the petitioners and the witnesses have to say and to take on board any questions or comments from the Commission. However, since we will not be in a position to provide responses today, we propose to follow up in writing in the next 30 days on all of these matters. We would welcome the opportunity to appear and discuss these issues at a future hearing before the Commission. We would like to thank you for raising these issues and assure you that we will follow up in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wish to acknowledge, as I have in the other hearings involved in the United States, that the Commission duly received the request from the United States to postpone these hearings. Um, and decided to proceed. The primary purpose of these hearings um, is to provide an opportunity for the Commission to receive information on important human rights issues. Um, almost all are at the request of petitioners from throughout the Americas, and this gives us a good opportunity to receive information on an important issue which the Commission has been deeply concerned with. Um, I wish to say, as I have in the other hearings, we welcome the opportunity to have the response of the Government of the United States um, 
in writing at a later stage in the next month or so. Um, and we will invite the petitioners if they wish to share any additional information with the state so that it can respond more appropriately and accordingly. Um, before I, um, I wish to give my fellow commissioners an opportunity to ask further questions and comments, beginning with um, the Rapporteur for the Rights of Migrant Workers, Commissioner Gonzalez. Muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes y gracias por las presentaciones de las partes. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, each side's presentation. I wanted to explain uh, how important it is to continue to follow up on the report that we issued a few years ago about the situation of migrants in the United States. And this has been done through public hearings and through work done with both sides. What we've attempted to do is ensure that this is an effective tool for strengthening the rights of migrant workers and their families in the United States. In this regard, I would like to share some necessary considerations which I believe to be essential. First is the criminalization of uh, irregular immigration. The Commission it has been calling attention to this for several years and this has also been done in the United Nations. In a series of states, and uh, the Commission specifically pointed out the United States in this particular report, we've seen in practice that this is uh, considered to be a type of crime, that is, the illegal crossing of borders. And this is accompanied by practices, uh, widespread practices of detention which have a specific characteristics that we've seen in some immigration detention centers where there have been people uh, who have not yet been subjected to criminal proceedings. And often these people lack a, a, the ability to assert their rights We've seen their acts being criminalized, even though they are not criminal acts, and also uh, the fact that they do not enjoy rights that other people accused of crimes enjoy. So in the report, the Commission called upon the creation of a civil detention center wherein the, it could justify the detention of immigrants. The at the heart of uh, the presentation made by the petitioners in this hearing, it, what's important we, is that much more attention is being paid both in the report and in the case system and precautionary measures. In the matter of the deportation of persons, that there is a need to strike a balance, uh, especially for humanitarian considerations. This has been uh, supported through a series of mechanisms from the Commission. There are a series of cases uh, with both the United States and other countries. Here we heard one of the more pertinent uh, cases, Pichiano and Dardis, and people of different nationalities who have been deported or who are about to be or scheduled to be deported from the United States, in which it seems uh, that the uh, precautionary measures have not been implemented in the sense that the humanitarian aspect has not been taken into account. There's a series of different laws that, that allow judges to make the discretion to make these decisions and certain ways of interpreting the law that at the end of the day it have have the other government agencies have not made uh, such decisions and this is not just an interpretation of international law this is something we've seen in uh, the United Nations, in uh, the European human rights institutions. 
these types of humanitarian considerations must be taken into account in order to protect families and children's children. This is a very important point that you raise. And the commission has seen cases of persons who have been living in the United States for decades. Their spouses are American. Their children were born and raised in the United States. And yet this is a law a regulation that has been applied uh, almost automatically without any consideration for protection of the family or the rights. Something else that was been addressed in the report on immigration in the United States that had to do with the current status of access to justice and due process. This was one of the pillars of the report, and this is in some one way or another connected into what came before. You look at due process in the case of deportation, but we can even go beyond that. And uh, this is something we would ask the state to respond to in writing when they provide their response. Good afternoon. Thank you also for coming today, both the state, regardless of whether you gave a response, we are happy to have you here, and of course the um, petitioners. I had a few comments. Um, one was that um, I appreciate that the thrust of the hearing today is about family and workers, and that's a very important issue in terms of the migration in the United States. But I also just wanted to mention, because it's also of concern to us at the Commission, the issue of deportees, um, and we've had this for quite a long time, um, particularly in the Caribbean, and I'm from the Caribbean, so it's a life concern. Persons who have lived all their lives in the United States and are deported, sometimes for minor offenses. So I, I wanted to bring that back up on the table, because also that issue is raised alongside those concerns about having no families, in, in this case, in the receiving countries. So those issues, I think it's not an insular, the migration policy is not insular. The impact is actually universal, or at least international, on other countries which they're um, deported to. And I think there's need for further study on this. It also raises the issue of even those persons who are deported because of a conviction, it might be a minor conviction, I think it also raises the issue of proportionality in terms of sentencing and so on, because you may have it could be just a traffic violation. And you spend all your life in the States and you're deported to um, another country, whether it be Trinidad, as the case may be, where you have no family ties, etc., which results in even more social dislocation. So the impact is actually universal. Um, the other point I wanted to raise, uh, racial profiling was mentioned, and as um, rapporteur on the rights of African descendants and against discrimination, I think that's an important issue to remind us about. Um, and I wanted to find out whether we have or you intend to do or whether there are available actual studies or statistics in relation to the lack of um, discretion with regard, you talk about prosecutorial discretion, whether you have any sorts of um, statistics which would demonstrate by race who's been deported more or less, etc., family members. I think I know the answer, but I just wanted to know whether we are actually going in that di direction because that, of course, is a very important issue for us uh, generally in terms of human rights and at the commission. Um, it seems to me, though, that it's not really about particular agents or specific agents, immigration officers and so on, not exercising discretion, the prosecu prosecutorial discretion. It seems to me that there is a policy or unwritten policy not to, um, not to, uh, not to consider these issues. There's a rigid policy in place, so perhaps we should be directing our attention to that, to the policy behind the fact that these persons are not, in fact, deciding, okay, you have a family and therefore you should stay. So I think that's really what uh, we should be concerned of in terms of international human rights. And uh, finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the workers' rights, because you probably know we have a new unit, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Unit. We call it DESK. And it's the, the relationship between um, freedom of association and other rights relation to, to, to workers 
who are migrants. It's very interesting the way in which that whole issue ex is exacerbated because of a, a, a migrant policy which can be seen to be inequitable. And in fact, from what you've described, not only inequitable, but indeed even unethical uh, employers who may, um, they, what we heard there about not paying salaries, etc., on a basic level, but calling in the immigration authorities. I think that's what you were saying. I think that is something that is, is very important for us to, to look at and to see how um, an, uh, an inequitable and unfair and unjust migration policy can really spiral to undermine other rights which are universally accepted, like freedom of association. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to begin by thanking the petitioners for the very valuable information that you have presented to us today. I would also like to thank the state for your presence. And I will repeat what I said in the previous hearings. We regret that we will not be receiving the due response on the part of the state during this hearing because the ultimate objective of these hearings is to obtain information first from the petitioners and also this gives the state an opportunity to share its points of view and perspectives vis-a-vis -vis what the petitioners have stated and this enriches the knowledge that the Commission has on the issues being presented. I would therefore like to repeat what I stated in previous hearings. I, we regret the lack of response on the part of the state, though we do look forward to receiving that information subsequently. I believe it is very important uh, for the state to update us on what measures it has adopted to implement the recommendations made by the Commission in the report on immigration in the United States, detentions and due process. This is a report from 2010. I think it's very important for the state to indicate to us what public policies have been developed, what changes or legislative changes have been implemented, or what administrative practices are being fostered. in order to ensure the respect of the rights of immigrants is in three different areas specifically. First, in making the measures adopted by immigration authorities consistent with respect for families, for family units, and for the best interests of the child. It would be very important for us to receive information in that respect. Then another matter that is especially important is that of workers' rights and social uh, security of, of migrant workers. As we know, Many employers take advantage of the situation of migrants, as we've heard today. The testimony that we heard during this hearing. So what they do is they take advantage of it to abuse the labor rights of immigrants. It is therefore of the utmost important that we hear what legislative advances have been made in harmonizing these 
labor policies with with a stability and the assurance of effective remuneration and that are consistent with social security and then another issue is what measures or what changes in the law have been promoted in order to decriminalize immigration. A person who migrates from any country of Latin America to the United States is normally prompted by basic needs and immigration per se is not a crime and it is therefore important to know what measures are being promoted to humanize the treatment of immigrants. And lastly, I would like to know what progress has been made in investigating and penalizing the actions taken by certain authorities, as we heard about today, for example, where immigrants are being mistreated, they're being subjected to treatment that are inconsistent with human dignity, and therefore I would like to know what policies are being pursued to investigate and sanction these uh, this mistreatment of immigrants. Six minutes um, to respond, and you may wish some additional persons to to um, to respond to the state. I I wanted more information on the 2013 um, directive um, on um, U.S. immigration policy, uh, which does address um, some issues relating to family ties or family situations, but to find out or information is that it does not necessarily address the concerns which the petitioners have raised and whether the government is considered considering um, more comprehensive policy directives which will address this question. Can I hand over to the petitioners? Thank you, Honorable Commissioner. Um, First, in response to uh, the, uh, the state's comments regarding its participation today, uh, we reiterate our position of, of our October 16th communication. Without prejudice to that, we look forward to uh, submitting further written submissions to the commission to supplement what we have already sent, um, and also to receiving written comments from the state and to, uh, to following up on this uh, important dialogue. Um, both through uh, further written correspondence and through future hearings. Um, now, going to uh, the issue of uh, the current situation of, uh, of uh, racial profiling and, and statistics on it, uh, we would point out that it is already um, uh, something that, that has been uh, examined through writing um, from prior petitioners who have uh, brought thematic hearings to this commission uh, in the sense of uh, requesting disaggregated uh, statistics from the United States. From, from what we understand, those statistics are still forthcoming. Um, as, as related to, um, to racial profiling, uh, anecdotally, we have members of our, uh, of our delegation who can speak to that um, very specifically. Um, would you like to? Thank you very much, uh, Susan Akram. I direct a, a human rights clinical program at Boston University, and my clinic and myself have been engaged in representing Arab and Muslim non-citizens for many, many years. Uh, and I would like to just point out that uh, we've done a series of reports uh, that we have not yet submitted to the commission, but published elsewhere, um, showing dozens of specific policies and laws that have singled out Arabs and Muslims for unusual and exceptional treatment throughout the deportation detention process. Um, and I can speak to cases I myself have, have litigated, including the cases of uh, the two dozen 
cases uh, in which people around the country, Muslims and Arabs exclusively, were targeted for detention and deportation on the basis of secret evidence, evidence that was not disclosed to the individuals or their lawyers. And I'm still litigating a case today that we have been litigating for 20 years in which in our most recent hearing at the Fourth Circuit, a government counsel uh, admitted to the court that, uh, and the case is about the interpretation of the persecutor of others bar under asylum, and uh, government counsel admitted that uh, if what the court was looking for was specific evidence of uh, involvement in persecutory acts, there was none. So we have been litigating for 20 years, again, very high profile um, Arab Muslim activist um, on the basis of evidence that the government itself has admitted there is none to support their position. And this is only one of many, many cases we've been litigating. I want to point out two specific um, problematic areas, that is individuals who are stateless, and particularly Palestinians, who form an enormous group of uh, stateless population around the world. I have two Palestinian uh, clients right now who are in the United States for 34 and 35 years respectively, uh, have all U.S. citizen children, but because they were, uh, had the unfortunate, uh, made the unfortunate decision to be part of one of the major Muslim charities in this country that the U.S. government has systematically tried to dismantle the five major mo Muslim charities uh, which the U.S. has uh, shut down. Uh, the government has shut down and all of the individuals who are involved, if they were non-citizens, their families were rounded up, targeted, detained, and deported, and my two clients after being, as I said, in the U.S. for 34 and 35 years respectively last year were picked up and removed to Gaza even though they had no documents whatsoever to allow them to leave. We tried to obtain the permission of 40 countries to get them admitted so that they could stay together with their families, and the U.S. government executed the removal orders with no notice to their counsel, um, and now these families are permanently uh, split apart and there's no possibility of reuniting them. I will end there. These are simply two examples of a much, much deeper and broader problem uh, that we can also provide supplemental information to the Commission, should you desire. Thank you. Thank you. And in response to the question uh, regarding workers' rights, including economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, we would like to point out that the, the Court has already made it its own jurisprudence through the advisory opinion of uh, 2003 that, uh, that uh, migrants in a regular condition uh, are entitled to the same rights as, as every other migrant, including the, the right to uh, equality and non-discrimination. In this sense, uh, we will uh, submit uh, additional submissions, and uh, I see that we have one minute left, so um, I will turn over for final comments to, um, to our partners at uh, Endelon uh, to answer this question in a little more detail, and then we will send uh, further responses in writing, and we look forward to further dialogue. Sure. I think the the quick things I would mention around uh, workers and desk is that uh, the key issues that we address, the right to association, right, uh, collective bargaining, uh, right to uh, you know, organize and defend yourself at the workplace, are unfortunately not well addressed in the current legislative proposals for, for workers. Um, however, there are many options um, that are discussed in, in the AFL-CIO's memo um, for administrative actions. And one of the one of the things, for example, is there, uh, the civil and labor rights prosecutorial discretion memo that already exists, which includes the right to organize. However, has not um, hasn't been implemented. So, amongst the things that the state um, could address, which we would appreciate, is is that specific civil and labor rights prosecutorial discretion memo. Um, and also, if I could take a moment just to to address the questions of minor offenses and uh, racial profiling, um, I think there's a study that just came out that says. Recent, I mean, it's like a week ago that one in nine uh, persons that are that have been deported through programs like Secure Communities um, are have any criminal background. One in nine. When the public policy, publicly, is you know we're we're targeting we're prioritizing folks um, that are dangerous, folks that have a criminal background, and one in nine just isn't the case. Uh, racial profiling. Um, t everybody's familiar with with Arizona's uh, SB 1070. Um, what you know, it was, we've been able to defeat a big chunk of Arizona's 1070 on preemption on preemptive grounds, right? It's the federal 
uh, control over immigration. However, we, that the federal case did not take on the civil rights aspects of SB 1070. So the worst civil rights issues of Arizona's SB 1070, which still exist because of the federal law, because of the state of federal law, have not been addressed. And that several organizations from our groups are, lit are still litigating those civil rights issues of racial discrimination. Um, and the last thing I would say in terms of due process, if I may, um, is that I think a week ago, 17 activists stopped a deportation bus that's part of a, bless you, bless you, that's part of a, um, a, a federal program called Operation Streamline, which is basically like a fast track to charge folks with felonies, where you charge anywhere from 12 to 24 people with a felony like this without the most basic protections and safeguards for due process. Everything from translation to you know what the the, the pleas are, um, and so this is it, this this is happening across the U.S. Because of that action, Operation Streamline was closed for five days because folks are folks are desperate because this this deportation dragon is, is destroying their their families. Just and just to throw out you know just in the last month, there's been three cases of suicides in immigration detention, two in Arizona, and one just three days ago outside of a, in York, Pennsylvania. Um, first, I, I wish to offer a last word to Deputy Permanent Representative Governor. Thank you. Uh, no, just to thank the petitioners for the presentation today, thank the Commission, and uh, we stand ready to respond uh, in due time. My thanks to you um, for all the information. We're ready to receive additional information. Um, if you wish, and we will forward it to the state, and we look forward to their response um, in the next 30 days. Thank you very much.